Thank you. So like Gabby said, um, this is our last session of the series and we really appreciate everyone being here. Um, we're co-hosting this with the Center for Public Health Practice at the College of Public Health at OSU. Um, and we're very happy to have you and that you stuck around during our 12 minutes of technical difficulties. So this is a list of the partners that we've been working with and I always like to take the opportunity to thank them for their guidance and planning. Some housekeeping information, um, all the participants are muted and um, not able to chat or share video. So that's normal if you're experiencing that. We will share the speaker's slides and recordings after. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A function or the chat function and our team will be monitoring it, minus me because I'm stuck. Um, and then for CEUs, we will forward an evaluation that you have to complete to be able to get your cer certificates and we'll be processing that later this month. So hopefully by January, you will get your certificates. So today, Dr. Turplin will um, moderate a facilitated discussion with our speakers. They will each get around 10 minutes for introductory remarks. Some of them have slides and others don't. So I will let Dr. Turplin introduce himself briefly and then we will start with Deanna's presentation. Great, well, thank you. Thank you everyone for um, coming, uh, uh, persisting through the, the, the technical difficulties and et cetera. I'm delighted to be here. I'm really looking forward to hearing what everyone has to say and in particular, you know, to the conversation. Um, I really, this, <clears throat> the, I was thinking about this this morning, actually, that there are these, you know, essential domains and, you know, of, of so we think of, you know, sexual health is an essential domain of wellness, yet we, you know, kind of forget about it in particular, you know, along the intersections of substance use, um, you know, drug addiction treatment, and in particular, I think, around in the context of recovery. Um, also thinking about how um, to the same way that, you know, sexual health is universal, you know, part of human existence, to a large extent, so too is substance use. And, um, and yet, you know, instead of viewing it from that more, you know, universal humanistic part of human behavior, part of human culture, part of human history, um, you know, in our particular historical moment, not only do we treat, you know, sexuality in a particularly like narrow and um, constrained kind of way, so too do we approach sort of substances. So I'm really looking forward to, you know, um, exploring these intersections with all of you. Um, I will leave it at that. Um, in terms of, you know, there's the chat features to go through, there's, you know, uh, and I really want this, um, you know, following the presentations to very much be a dialogue amongst all of us. So thank you. And um, next. <laughs> Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, I am Deanna Harold. I work for the Ohio Department of Job and Family Services. I am a policy developer there. Um, prior to working at ODGFS, I worked at Franklin County Children's Services for 24 years, and I was one of the intake administrators there um, prior to coming over to the state office. And at the state, I'm primarily working as a policy developer for child welfare rules. Um, in Ohio Administrative Code, Ohio Revised Code. And for the last couple of years, I have been working on the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act and the training um, of it across Ohio. This um, legislation impacts um, families and infants that are um, dealing with substance misuse in their families. So next slide. Um, what is CARA? CARA is the Comprehensive Addiction Recovery Act, which was signed into law back in uh, July of 2016. What CARA focuses on is the nation's opioid epidemic. Um, the most important piece of CARA is that this is a collaborative uh, legislation that involves not only child welfare, but other um, agencies across the, the states. Um, I can, it, um, involve the hospitals, treatment centers, mental health, 
um, pediatricians help me grow, all the different providers that um, come in contact with this identified population. Um, the three primary systems essentially that are working um, with these families um, and CARA are the hospitals, community providers, and child welfare. Within the hospital system, primarily it's the labor and delivery people, um, the social workers and the nurses um, that are working with that or that mother as she's delivering. Um, the community providers are the substance abuse treatment agencies, um, working with the moms that are in MAT therapy, um, some of the mental health providers, as well as the pediatricians and medical staff that are working with those infants that um, are impacted by substance use. And of course, our uh, child welfare agency. Um, one of the goals for CARE is for the, these three entities, which are big entities in Ohio, um, to work collaboratively um, towards the goal of establishing a good plan of safe care for uh, these families. And what is a plan of safe care? Um, this plan of safe care essentially um, describes the services and supports needed to address the needs of the infants who have been prenatally exposed to the abuse of substances, um, both legal and illegal, um, and their families. So the plan of safe care needs to identify all the family members um, in that home that are impacted by substance misuse. That can be mom, that can be dad, boyfriend, and any other caregiver in the home. Um, the plan of safe care should describe all the substance use disorder treatment services that the family is linked to um, and any developmental or medical intervention that's needed for that baby. Um, the plan of safe care should be a plan moving forward um, that supports this family throughout their uh, treatment and in, to ensure the, the safety and risk of that infant is minimized. Um, Family members should be involved in creating this plan of safe care, and ideally these plans would be put into place prior to mom delivering at the hospital. Many times that is not able to happen or doesn't happen, but if a mom is in MET therapy prior to delivery, a good plan of safe care should already be established and communication across agencies um, would be ideal. Um, these plans of safe care and the work with this family may or may not involve um, the child welfare agencies. And I can explain that further on um, in my slides. Um, the impact on child welfare um, as a result of legislation coming into place, um, Ohio Administrative Code was updated. Um, that's chapter 5012-36, and that's the screening and investigation um, rule. I updated this, um, this rule package to include the language um, of CARA. So some of the additional requirements that were added into um, rule were that we needed to ensure the safety and well-being of these infants upon release from the medical um, hospitals. We need to address the health and substance use disorder treatment needs of the infant and all the affected family members and caregivers. Um, one of the other um, requirements is that monitoring of the plans of safe care and determining whether and how local entities are making referrals and delivering appropriate services both to the infant and caregivers. Um, and just a reminder again, language was added um, to rule to include legal and illegal substances. Some of the impact on child welfare as a result of CARA, um, child welfare needs to report on a yearly basis to the National uh, Child Abuse and Neglect Data System, which we call NCANS. And as a result of CARA, um, the three things that we need to re report back are the number of infants identified as being affected by substance abuse, um, withdrawal symptoms resulting from prenatal exposure or fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. We also need to report the number of infants um, that a plan of safe care is developed for and the number of infants for whom referrals were made for services. Um, and those uh, referral numbers include um, services for the affected family member or uh, caregiver. Um, I think on the bottom is kind of a repeat of what I've already said. CAPTA, um, 
as a result of care was amended. Um, and the amendment includes um, requiring a plan of safe care to be in place at the time of discharge from the hospital. Um, this is required for infants 12 months or younger if they've been prenatally exposed to substances, they're demonstrating symptoms of withdrawal at birth, or they're diagnosed with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Um, as we know, many times a um, FES diagnosis isn't done um, until way down the road when, when kids are older. Um, in addition, um, CAPTA is now requiring child welfare agencies to document the existence of the plan of safe care. So that is being done within our um, statewide data system, which is called SACWIS. All of this data is entered into there. And then um, at the appropriate time, we pull that data down and we report it back um, to NCANS. Excuse my dog, someone, if you can hear it barking. I'm getting a delivery as we speak, my apologies. Um, <clears throat> As a result of CARA, some of the expectations for mandated reporters, um, just wanted to give an update. Um, overall, the requirements for uh, mandated reporters have not changed. Um, and per Ohio Administrative Code, all man mandated reporters um, need to make a referral to their local PCSA, um, which is their child welfare agency, when an infant is impacted by the abuse of legal or illegal substances. And these reports need to be made um, when an infant is exhibiting signs of withdrawal, mother abused illegal or illegal substances during pregnancy, the infant has a positive toxology um, report, or the infant is diagnosed with fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, at the end, um, I think it's most important to note that the child welfare agencies are the decision makers, the referrals need to be called in. Um, they're not necessarily screened in, but they need to be called in and child welfare um, notes that either a plan of safe care is in place and it's adequate or a plan of safe care is not in place um, and we need to screen that case in for further monitoring. Um, some of the um, action steps that we need to be having put into place at the hospitals are just the, the requirement that the medical information on the infants, parents, and or caregivers of the identified infant need to be shared during that referral to child welfare, um, along with any of the toxology results, withdrawal information, and a medical treatment plan if it is in place for that infant. Um, if available, the health and substance use history of the mother, father, and caregivers um, who reside in the home also need to be um, collected and shared with child welfare when a referral is made. Um, screening expectations for child welfare. Um, CPS agencies are required to collect um, this information on all referrals that come in for an infant that has been identified as being substance exposed. And let me just say, um, an infant for CARA, um, under CARA is defined as 12 months or younger. In Ohio Administrative Code, infant is defined as 18 months or younger. So I just wanna make sure that that distinction is known. Um, we need to make sure that a plan of safe care has been established that it addresses the safety needs of the infant and addresses all the substance use treatment needs of the family member or caregivers. If we're not able to um, collect information which supports that, we child welfare is expected to screen that case in for an investigation. The next slide is just a quick synopsis of what it looks like at the child welfare agency. Um, the gray bar um, represents the referral that is called in from mandated reporters. Um, these cases are screened in, which is the blue if they're, the plan of safe care is not adequate. And that essentially means that the case is open for an assessment investigation at the child welfare level. Um, and um, they'll do a um, safety assessment and a family assessment. And that takes approximately 45 days to have done. And if during that assessment period, a plan of safe care has been established and documented that it's meeting the needs of that family, child welfare can close their case out at that time um, and no other services um, will be needed for that family. 
somehow the arrow got misplaced, but um, if there is um, a need for continued um, involvement from child welfare, that case would be transferred to ongoing. And during that time period and ongoing, a case plan is developed and essentially a plan of safe care is created. And throughout this um, open case at child welfare, they will be monitoring and ensuring that families are linked with appropriate services and documenting all of that within our data system. The green box is basically um, stating that what, after a referral comes in and all the information is gathered, we are stating that um, at the screen out that a plan of safe care is in place and that it meets the needs of the infant and the family caregivers. Um, so no PCSA involvement is needed at that time. And from there, um, ongoing monitoring of that plan of safe care is expected to be done by the service providers that are linked with that mother and family. Um, this just talks about some of the um, child welfare information um, and enhancements within SACWIS. Um, I don't think all of you need to know all of it, but just know that um, we're continuing to enhance our data system um, in order to draw down information um, specific to this population. Um, some of the things that we're working on right now is enhancing our service referrals to um, draw down information on where exactly these families are being referred to and linked um, if a case is opened. Um, also, we are adding um, information on the substances that um, mom is using or misusing um, so that we can draw down um, percentages and numbers on that as well. Um, so that's something that we're continuing to work on and if people have um, ideas of additional information that maybe we can draw out of our system, feel free to um, forward on uh, that information to me. And that is essentially all. I did too wanna share that um, there has been some brochures and pamphlets um, that have been created um, for CARA that have been distributed across Ohio. Um, if you guys are interested in receiving the, that information, um, I can share that with Ann and maybe she can um, forward it on to everybody that is on here. Um, but it basically explains to moms that are involved in MAT what the plan of safe care is and what, how that impacts them, um, as well as some informational brochures for um, hospitals and medical staff and treatment facilities that have been created um, so let me know if you guys want that. I am more than happy to share those documents with everybody. And that's all. Thanks. Um, hi, everyone. Um, this is Rena Oza Frank. I am the Data and Surveillance Administrator in the Bureau of Maternal, Child, and Family Health at the Ohio Department of Health. And I'll be um, providing an overview of the Omni initiative that took place um, over the last year. So Omni stands for Opioid Use Disorder, Maternal Outcomes, and Neonatal Abstinence Syndrome Initiative. And recognizing systems gaps in provision of perinatal care and services, CDC partnered with the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, or ASTO, to launch the Omni Learning Community, uh, which supports systems change and capacity building across 17 states. And you can see the states participating in Omni on the map on the slide here. Uh, the blue states, which is where Ohio is located, there's 12 states in blue, are part of the first wave of the Omni work. And then the five states in the um, red or orange are in the second wave of the Omni work. Um, on this slide, you can see the Omni Corps Committee for Ohio. Um, and it includes uh, different uh, representatives from various uh, agencies and organizations um, in Ohio. So the purpose of Omni is to disseminate strategies and best practices supporting program and policy implementation related to substance use disorder among pregnant and postpartum women and infants diagnosed with NAS. 
the goals that were defined by the Ohio Omni, Omni team were first to convene statewide governing body to identify strategies and opportunities for improving quality coordination of care to optimize health outcomes for women with SUD and their children across their life course. The second goal was to support development of consistent functioning and standardized plans of safe care in four Appalachian counties in Ohio, which were Athens, Gallia, Ross, and Scioto counties. And finally, to implement more than two or equal to two best practices to improve care coordination and transition care before and following delivery and through the life course. So we were fortunate in Ohio, uh, ASTO supported four states in the first wave of the Omni Learning Collaborative to have a field placement. Um, so that was a full-time employee of ASTO placed at um, our health department to um, help facilitate implementation of our state's action plan. Um, and our, our uh, field placement was Abra Greenberg. So Omni lasted or was from August 2019, relatively speaking, to September 2020. So Abra ended her placement with us in September of this year, um, but she was the one that uh, led uh, our local um, efforts in those four counties mentioned. Um, and we did that work through local journeying sessions where we um, held uh, sessions, uh, webinars within those counties um, to do the following. First, identify interventions to improve completion and utilization of plans of safe care, as well as coordination of care, as well as identify opportunities to utilize what resources are already available in the counties for additional resources needed to improve communication and for policy changes. So um, the local journeying sessions occurred from May through July um, of this year. As you guys can imagine, and as we've all had to pivot, uh, we were really hoping those would be in person, um, but ended up being all virtual, um, which uh, went off just fine. Um, I think we missed some of that face-to-face -face interaction, but still um, very fruitful conversations. Um, the sessions focused on mother-infant dyad navigation, through postpartum and how plans of safe care are utilized, implemented, and communicated. Uh, it also was an opportunity to share and discuss um, findings. And then we um, used the findings to recommend local and state level policy changes and practice interventions. So general observations, next slide, um, thank you, uh, were that uh, most participants in these four counties were actually not familiar with plans of safe care. Um, Deanna was a wonderful partner for us. Um, she, the, the information you just heard from her, plus additional information um, was shared by Deanna with the four counties. Um, and so she, during the journeying sessions, gave, gave that overview and was available for questions. So, so I think that was, um, I think for us, maybe not so much for Deanna, but for us was that kind of surprising that most participants were not familiar with plans of safe care. And those that were aware of plans of safe care um, were challenged on how to best implement them. And I don't think that that was a surprising finding. I think that, that we were expecting that to be one of the challenges identified. Um, we found out that many plans of safe care are not developed until delivery. Um, which also was probably not a surprising finding. And uh, each county is at a different stage of implementation of plans of safe care, if they are at all in the different stages of planning um, implementation. Um, and then that the um, JFS template is rarely being used to complete plans of safe care if in fact they are completing them. So most of these findings were not necessarily news to us, but um, again, I think through the uh, interaction between the various entities that participated in the journeying sessions, it was an opportunity for them to kind of hear from each other um, these similar themes. After the journeying sessions, we conducted a survey to kind of um, gauge different pieces of information. And here's, here are some uh, high level points of what we found from that post survey. Um, that hospitals in those local areas need to be more engaged with the implementation of plans of safe care. Um, generally speaking, and overall for the county's benefit, there needs to be a better understanding of plans of safe care. And this is across the, the various entities represented again at these journeying sessions. Um, they suggested that having a simplified, easier plan of safe care template would improve completion of 
the plan. Um, for example, using checkbox and drop down options. Um, barriers do exist to completing the plan of safe care, such as stigma, fear, and access to care that we're all familiar with. Um, and more education is needed uh, regarding improving outreach, addressing stigma, and again, in general, on plans of safe care. One of the counties that participated in all the journeying sessions was Fairfield County, um, and they, uh, through grant funding, have been able to fund a full-time coordinator to help implement plans of safe care, and, and that has proven to be a really beneficial strategy, um, and again, was shared as a strategy for, for other counties to, to consider, um, of course, with um, available funding, if possible. And then there needs to be improved committee work and collaboration for planning for plans of safe care implementation, as well as a consistent method uh, to improve um, sharing plans of safe care information to families themselves. So out of, out of Omni came the following recommendations. Um, implementation of stigma and implicit bias trainings. Uh, involvement from the Ohio Hospital Association to encourage hospital participation and completion of plans of safe care. Um, with the Ohio Perinatal Quality Collaborative, continuing to drive importance of consistent, cons consistent use of plans of safe care through their work. Simplified plans of safe care templates should be created. An assessment of plans of safe care should be consistent across counties if possible. The incorporation of universal screenings. The development of universal release of information to allow for sharing of information. Changes to SACWIS that Deanna mentioned to allow for sharing of information. Creation of a public information campaign about plans of safe care. And finally, work toward development of plans of safe care during pregnancy, not just at delivery. So the educational interventions that we were able to implement post um, the journeying sessions were some resources available through the March of Dimes. Uh, and these were offered initially to just those four counties that participated, but then eventually were opened up beyond those four counties as well. Um, and the educational interventions were uh, addressing the effects of stigma on women with substance use disorders, or, or this, the training is called Beyond Labels. We also offered the implicit bias training through March of Dimes on breaking through the bias in maternal care. And then e-learning um, specific to NAS and addressing models of care which support the baby and family. So I mentioned that the Omni Learning Community work has um, what actually technically finished um, as of the end of September this year, but uh, the work continues um, through the um, Practice and Policy Academy, which is a collaborative that has now started and is being led by uh, Ohio MHAS or Mental Health and Addiction Services and sponsored by SAMHSA. That's it, thank you. So it's my turn. I didn't bring any slides, um, partly just because I didn't want to, but also because I figured that Mishka has probably already told you a little bit about um, our the most recent work that, that my organization has done. So um, to back up a little bit, hi everybody, I'm Joelle. I'm a registered nurse. I've been working in perinatal care for 17 years or maybe it's 18 now, I don't know, a very long time. And I am primarily a newborn intensive care nurse, but I've also done um, some, some postpartum work as well. In addition to that, for 11 years now, I've been working in um, syringe access programs, which for those of you that don't know, it's also sometimes known as needle exchange. Very little uh, minor difference. Syringe access does not require people to bring a needle in order to give you a needle. We, give out needles and we take needles, but we don't force people to, you know, we don't do one for one exchange because we believe that uh, if somebody needs a needle, they don't have to have a dirty one um, to give back. Um, another issue with that is sometimes you'll get, you know, three people with one needle and we don't wanna give three people one needle. We wanna make sure everybody has enough for what they do. So um, I'm from Seattle and that's where I started doing that work. Uh, I worked for the People's Harm Reduction Alliance which is one of the largest by volume syringe access programs in the country. And we're entirely funded by donations and grants. 
we don't uh, take any government funding. And so that's pretty cool too, when people say, oh, I don't wanna waste my tax dollars on that. Well, you're not, congratulations. Um, uh, and since the last few years, I've been a traveling nurse, which means I work for agencies that place me for three to six months at hospitals around the country. So through that work, I've been really fortunate to see the different ways that uh, these families are cared for in different parts of the country. And even really what I find most interesting is how they're cared for at different hospitals within the same geographical area. Um, for example, when I work at hospitals that serve primarily middle and upper class insured housed people, I see very little uh, drug testing and very little, uh, we don't catch many people who are using drugs in those situations. And then when I work for county hospitals that primarily serve poorer populations, black and brown populations, they drug test every single person. And we see a lot more people getting caught and uh, getting punitive interventions placed upon their families. So that has been really fascinating. So far, let's see, I'm licensed in eight or nine states. And I think I've worked at 12 or 13 hospitals within the last uh, five years or so. So it's been really, really eye-opening. Um, just to see how that works. Um, and another thing that's been really fascinating with doing travel nursing is that you, like I've, I've worked at a few places that I had heard of before because they have these wonderful, magnificent, progressive programs. And when, when I go there, I'm like, oh, you just, you just say that on paper and you do things the same as they do it everywhere else. Um, and that's that, I, I wish I could report that that hadn't been my universal experience, but that that has been what I've seen just about everywhere that I've gone. Um, so in addition to my syringe access work and my uh, paid work in hospitals as a nurse, I've also recently started the Academy of Perinatal Harm Reduction with a couple of colleagues. And I'm just gonna put that, I am bad at talking and doing something at the same time. So I'm just gonna put that in the chat real quick, this is our website, please do check it out. It won't do it, okay, hang on. Okay, there is the website, please do check it out. Um, we have a ton of resources on there. Our goal is to be um, uh, a source of education for everybody involved in perinatal care for people, pregnant and parenting people who use substances. So this project started about five years ago. Um, I gave a presentation about uh, rewriting hospital policies at the place that I worked at the time regarding this population. And a group of us came out of that conference saying, yes, we need to, oh, it didn't link. Um, Gabby, I think you're the tech person. Would you mind making that a link for me so I don't have to stop talking? Yes. Thank you so much. Um, where was I? So a group of us came together and we said, it's, it's, a, it's shameful that we don't have best practice guidelines for hospital care of these families. So let's, let's do that. And out of that grew this massive project where the goal was to have a best practices guideline for medical providers, for nurses, for social workers, for lawyers, for judges, for hospital administrators, and most importantly, for families. Because oftentimes, uh, each of those groups is getting different information and has different goals and is not communicating with each other. And, and the people that get hurt by this kind of disconnect in care practices are the families and the babies. So we worked on that for several years and it finally has come to fruition in the, um, in the toolkit that we recently released with the Harm Reduction Coalition. And I'm gonna see if I can get this one to link this time um, in the chat. And that's the one that Dr. Turplin also worked on. Let's see, there we go, I got it. So that's the link. It's, uh, it's 110 pages, so it's kind of a lot. I'm going to kind of summarize it for you all right now. Um, but it, it's a lot because there is a lot. There's a lot to deal with. And we want people to, uh, 
to be able to navigate all of this. Our patients are expected to navigate each of those silos that we all like to stay inside of. They're expected to be able to navigate the child welfare and legal systems. They're expected to be able to navigate the hospital system. And they're expected to do all of this while managing their own health in the postpartum period often because a lot of these folks uh, don't access care prior to delivery as, uh, as other folks have said. So um, really briefly to go over that toolkit, we have six sections. And the first one is about your rights as a patient, because a lot of times I think the reason such egregious abuses are perpetrated against these families in the healthcare system is because they don't know their rights and they don't know um, how to stick up for themselves. And so we talk a little bit about your rights as far as confidentiality. Um, I don't know about all of you, but in the places that I work, people love to gossip about families with substance use behind the nursing station. Oh, you wouldn't believe what so-and-so did. Oh, this mom said she's been coming in, but she hasn't came in at all. Any of the time she said she's so late, she's probably high. And we see that kind of thing all the time. And families often don't know that that's not okay and that's not normal. So educating patients about their rights in order to uh, so that they can demand appropriate care from their providers is really important. Our next section uh, is about harm reduction for various classes of substances. And we could have gone on uh, a lot more, but we chose just six main classes of substances that, pe that people find themselves in trouble for, which would be alcohol, benzodiazepines, cannabis, opioids, stimulants, including caffeine, to, um, excuse me, caffeine, cocaine, and methamphetamine, and then tobacco and nicotine. And you may find it, if you're going through that uh, our our analysis of the science is a little bit different from what you see elsewhere. Folks tend to see us as radical, but uh, we like to see ourselves as uh, just value neutral and science-based. So we're not really going through here uh, looking for problems where we, we don't have we don't have an end goal when we analyze the science. So when we are looking at effects of substances on pregnancy and on child outcomes, we just look at what does the science say. Um, oftentimes what you'll see when you're reading some of these papers is if you look at the data that they find, they find either no effect or extremely uh, minute differences all still within the range of normal limits for uh, what we would expect from any population. But then at the end, in the conclusion, authors tend to say, this shows clearly that these babies are hurt by their parents' uh, substance exposure, and we need to intervene in the most strongest way. And then what happens is that research gets interpreted into the regular media and into guidelines and by organizations like the American Academy of Pediatrics, et cetera, et cetera. And at each step of interpretation, the, uh, the prognosis becomes more dire. And uh, we try to avoid all that by going straight to the data and saying, here's what the data says. Um, so you may find uh, that refreshing or you may find it disturbing. Either way, I suggest that you take a look at it. I also always uh, strongly encourage people at every presentation that I give, if you see something that looks weird, do some research. If you think that we've arrived at conclusions that are wrong, please contact us. We are super nice and we won't be mean to you and we want to have that dialogue. Um, even, if, even if you send us a message saying you're crazy and you're wrong and you're hurtful and we want to have those conversations because we think that if we all just sit in our little comfort zone and, and don't talk to each other, then that's going to hurt our, our patients and our babies. And that's what we do not want. Our next section is about navigating the healthcare and legal systems. And I'll speak to this a little bit, although I am a nurse and not a lawyer. We partnered with some amazing organizations such as National Advocates for Pregnant Women, who I believe you all are familiar with. Um, Elephant Circle, Movement for Family Power. And these are groups that, uh, that advocate for families um, in the legal system. And it, it's, uh, it's, it's a very subtle difference, but um, oftentimes nurses and healthcare providers don't feel that it is their job to advocate for families in, in these situations. I've 
been instructed many a time by bosses and, and hospital social workers that it is not my job to advocate for the family. It is my job to advocate for the hospital. So, uh, and I obviously disagree with that quite heartily. So this section is aimed at assisting families and care providers in developing those plans of safe care and in working with families with the goal of keeping families intact. And that's an issue that I see a lot, uh, that I see absent a lot when we're talking about policies and how to care for these families. Um, very rarely do you find the goal of a policy or program or one of the outcome measure being how many of these families remain intact uh, without suffering uh, custody, custody loss. Because we know that there are some possible risks of substance exposure, but we also know that there are very real and actual and documented harms of separating children from families. So it's very, very important uh, especially for healthcare providers, not to just assume that uh, once you get that kid into foster care that, you know, we can just, um, good, we did our job, all that's done, that baby's going to be totally happy now. Um, it's important to weigh both the risks and benefits of any action that we're, um, that we're imposing upon these families. Um, and so there's a lot about that in the in the section three, navigating the health and legal systems. And there's also um, in the appendices, a lot of really good resources. I believe Rena was talking about before um, for developing these plans of safe care in an in a easier and more user-friendly way. So you can check that out. We also talk about prenatal care, uh, which it, I've found in my travels that in places where they have programs that can identify and start serving these families in the prenatal period rather than when they arrive at the hospital, we have so much better outcomes, including less loss of custody. And then in places, um, for example, right now I'm in Arizona where there are very few services of any kind and particularly very few services for pregnant people who use substances. Um, custody loss is, is almost, almost guaranteed here, which is really, really sad. We talk about uh, the labor and delivery period, which for a lot of folks, especially folks who are tolerant of opioids can be really terrifying. Because if you show up to a hospital and you're in labor and you, they won't give you pain medication, that there, there's nothing more terrifying than that. So we talk a lot about both alternatives to opioid medications and the need for a lot of these folks to get four or five, six times the typical dose in order to create um, pain control in a safe and effective manner. We also talk a little bit about the postpartum period, which has a lot of those same issues with pain control. But another thing to think about is many of these uh, policies and programs, they focus on the pregnant person almost as uh, as, as a non-person, as an incubator for the baby, which is the one we really care about. And so what we see a lot of times is uh, six weeks to eight weeks after delivery, all of your services are cut off, your health is cut off, no more dental insurance. In many cases, even um, opioid agonist therapy, such as buprenorphine or methadone is cut off. And that's, that's, just, uh, that, that's just really counterproductive because there's, there's a quote that I really love. I forget who said it. Uh, it was, I believe it was a pediatrician he's, or an OB. Mishka, you might know. He said, there's no such thing as a baby. If you try to describe a baby, you'll find that you're describing a baby and someone. And so this idea that we that you even can only care about the baby without caring about the mother or the pregnant person is absurd. It's a dyad. And if you have a, you know, a six week old baby whose main caregiver has just been cut off from all support, that's, that's not gonna be good for the baby either. So it's really important to think about, uh, to think about the postpartum dyad and not just, uh, not just the baby. Um, and that, that's, my, that's my big recent work that's come out. The Academy of Perinatal Harm Reduction has also got our fingers in lots of pies right now 
we're developing projects with maternal child health programs, with organizations that advise child welfare systems across the country. We have a really cool project that should be coming to fruition within the next few weeks about, um, about that stigma busting like Rena was mentioning. Um, and it has, it's come out of a collaboration between us and the Urban Survivors Union, which is a drug users union with chapters all across the country. Uh, their headquarters is based in North Carolina right now. And what they've done is they've gathered a group of, I believe they're all women who have experience of pregnancy and substance use. Many of them also have experience of intimate partner violence, um, houselessness, various other traumas. And it's a collaboration of story writing and story sharing with the goal of, of really letting people into these lives to see what it's actually like, to see what it's like from the other side. And so they're, they've finished up the story writing and they're developing now a training program. So it, it'll be like an e-learning modules something like that where uh, where it goes into these stories and then there it uh, and then there'll be discussion and hopefully changing hearts and minds about folks that use substances. Uh, because I really think the most important thing about harm reduction is not necessarily any intervention or any idea. It's simply looking at people who use substances without moral judgments, which is a really hard thing to do, especially if you've been raised in the society that we all have been, where we view substance use as a moral failing or a criminal act in some cases. But if we take a step back and just look at substance use as a neutral thing that happens sometimes, then that makes harm reduction so easy. People often say, how do we integrate harm reduction into medicine? And I say medicine is harm reduction. Uh, harm reduction simply, uh, very simply put, means reducing harms and reducing risks. So when we think about any kind of medicine, whether it's cancer treatment or a broken leg, we're trying to create the best possible outcome for that person. And so with the broken leg example, we could just say, well, you shouldn't have broken your leg. What were you doing climbing that tree? How could you do that to yourself? How could you put your body at risk um, and just leave them alone and let it heal whichever way and then they have a limp for the rest of their life. Or we could put it in a cast, which is still gonna hurt and it did not eliminate any of those harms, but it's going to help create a better outcome as we go into the future. So I just like to invite everybody to think about harm reduction as, uh, yes, I'm almost done. Uh, harm reduction as medicine and medicine as harm reduction. There's no difference uh, between them. And I'll, I'll end there. We can begin the conversation. Hi everyone, as Gabby's getting the slides pulled up for you, um, I just briefly will introduce myself. I'm Meredith Shogren. I'm a clinical professor at the University of North Dakota and I'm a certified nurse midwife. And I was given the opportunity today to talk to you just a little bit about some of the added challenges we find in rural areas um, as far as addressing reproductive health services. Next slide. So um, just as a, a starting definition for rural areas, it's they're noted to have a combination of low population density, isolation, small size, and I would add to that geographical expanse. So we tend to have a large area with a small amount of people in it. And about 20% of Americans live in rural communities, which does include 18 million women of reproductive age. 82% um, of our rural counties are medically underserved, and that means a third of our, re our rural residents live in HIPSA areas where we are lacking primary care providers. And this is the most recent map um, put up by HRSA, where you can really see, um, especially through the center of our nation, how um, rural we are and how much we are lacking providers. Um, in addition to that, and, and more importantly to our discussion today, um, rural communities are consistently losing their maternal health services. And these include not only obstetric services, but family planning services, and um, really all tie in SUD treatment services to that as well. It's often secondary to workforce shortages. We just don't get a lot of people who want to move to rural areas to provide that care. Um, we have um, incredibly different types of social determinants of health that are contributing to our disparities, overall poorer health, lower health literacy that we see. Um, and we've had a number of hospital and obstetric department closures in our rural communities. 
um, up until 2014, 179 rural counties experienced closures. I can tell you in the past 10 years in the state of North Dakota, we have gone from 19 hospitals, and yes, that was our max, down to 11. Um, and unfortunately, most of the hospital closures have taken place in our very rural counties. Up to 40% of our counties have no OBGYNs, certified nurse midwives, or family physicians there to attend birth, which means that one in four women must leave their communities to give birth outside of their community. Fewer than 50% of rural women have access to perinatal services within a 30-minute drive, and more than 10%, it's a greater than 100-mile drive. And for us in rural areas, we often don't even talk about it in miles. We talk about it in how long does it take to get there. And you're talking about an hour to an hour and a half to two hours in some cases just to be able to access a hospital um, or facility where they feel safe to deliver um, their babies. Um, it's, um, and if you add winter into it, which we're coming into in North Dakota, it, you can add quite a bit of time and hazard onto that particular drive. Because of these negative challenges, we do see a, a significant difference in maternal mortality, for example, among women um, in rural communities and those who are in urban areas. Next slide. Um, in addition, we've seen a great change in our family planning services. So if they are available in rural communities, these clinics tend to offer a smaller range of services. There's often decreased flexibility. So um, in many cases, it's that, that it's a rotating service. So there'll be one provider who will be able to come into that rural community, maybe spend an afternoon, and they might not be back for two to three weeks or even greater than a month for them to come back. If the facilities are Title X facilities and have contraceptive options in-house, we find that they carry fewer options. Many of them do not carry LARCs, for example, simply because um, of the expense of stocking the devices. They have a lack of trained clinicians. Maybe they don't have that demand to be there or clinical policy just says we need to keep this down to say the pill option and barrier methods. So most will carry the pill. If it's a service offering family planning, but they do not stock on-site um, contraceptive methods. It usually requires either a referral um, to get that LARC placed or to have it filled. And in many cases, it's pretty rare to even have a pharmacy in our rural communities. Some of times what we see is that our pharmacies will have a pharmacy tech on staff. They'll be able to take the prescription, but they won't be able to fill it. Um, either because they don't have it or because they'll require a televisit with a PharmD just to complete that visit before it can be filled. So in a small town, that's pretty huge. Um, having to talk to somebody, explain it to more than one person, get the prescription filled, find a place where you feel like you can have a confidential visit, and that really impacts um, that, that access to service. Um, in addition, if they have to travel to another community, there's an added cost for them to get there to get that prescription filled or that LARC placed and many do not carry emergency contraceptives. It's also been determined that many rural obstetricians and physicians are less likely than our urban um, colleagues to provide abortion services. Next slide. There's an overall lack of sexual health care in our rural communities as well. And unfortunately, this includes a lot of our preventative um, screening things like screening for breast cancer. Um, it, if we can get mammograms, it's usually a mobile unit that comes traveling around the different counties to offer that service. Many of them are not having their cervical cancer screenings completed. We know that rural communities are less likely to offer STI screenings and treatment, and this just compounds itself into um, worsening diseases and higher spread of exposure. And there is an overall lack of patient education. Most of the time, um, it is connected to the stigma and, and a very conservative belief system that we find in many rural communities that can hinder that search for reproductive care. And to be quite honest, if you're an adolescent in these communities, you just don't talk about it. You don't know who to ask about it. You don't know how to get there to go get um, those services. And you, you really can't talk about it at home. Um, for Title X services nationwide, they're available and they're just a tremendous resource. But unfortunately, um, and I've worked in our family planning community in North Dakota, um, we've seen a steady decrease in the number of clients who are using those services. And when the final rule was issued in March of 2019, we did see a drastic change in services that were discontinued. And for those of you who aren't familiar, when the rule came out, it put very strict guidelines um, 
uh, around some of the education that we could offer, um, the mandated referral to prenatal care rather to abortion services. We increased the, uh, the amount of documentation and type of documentation that was necessary for seeing adolescent clients too. Um, because of that, many agencies chose to back out of their Title X funding and as a result, we reduced our service sites by 945 sites across the nation, many of which were in rural communities. Next slide. Um, we've also seen a substantial increase in substance use and misuse in rural communities. Um, and that's not common knowledge. Most people think that it's gotta be worse in, in the urban um, communities. And, and we've just seen lots of changes in our rural um, areas. We have found that overdose death rates are higher for females in our rural communities. And we have a high rate of opioid prescription um, delivery, diversion and misuse. Um, pregnant people with substance use disorders in our rural communities are often lacking that access to a comprehensive services, which results in a fragmented system of care. And what I mean by that is that if we do have a family practice provider that's there, they often don't come with obstetric experience and or substance use experience. If they're lucky enough to have somebody with obstetric experience who travels to that community, even just um, once a month, they might not have that um, background regarding SUD care as well. And if somebody is willing to start um, treatment and prescription coverage for somebody during the perinatal period, we often don't have that warm handoff to continue with that care in that postpartum period. So they're looking all over the place or driving to, you know, maybe three different providers in some cases during the course of a pregnancy just to receive care for all of their concerns. Um, sometimes this is secondary to a shortage of treatment providers. Sometimes it's stigma. Sometimes it's just that we don't have that shared expertise. Rural residents often lack education about substance use disorders and in particular harm reduction and life-saving measures. It is not uncommon in rural communities to have your emergency access to 911 services be very, very limited. Um, set up to 74% of rural EMTs are volunteers and unpaid in their positions. Um, in some cases, if they're farmers, they've got to get out of a field, get into the small town, get into the ambulance, get out to the setting, and you're adding so much time just to be able to, to, to be able to deliver some of these services. Many of the, the rural EMTs do not even carry naloxone um, and very few come with obstetric experience if there's an obstetric um, emergency that's going along with that. Tribal communities in our rural areas have been especially hit by lack of emergency access, um, secondary to such a large geographic area that um, we're covering for, for this access. Um, we need to talk a little bit about the particular culture of rural, and I do ask you to consider a rural community with its own culture. Um, a lot of people often say if you've seen one rural town, you've just seen one rural town. They will vary within 10 miles. The communities will feel very, very different to you, and they're not all homogenous. Um, each community has its own traditions, customs, values, geography, ethnicity, um, even their special hot dish <laughs> that they want to make will be very different community to community. Um, independence and self-reliance are instilled very early, which is a wonderful thing. However, that type of stoicism often leads to a population that does not like to reach out for assistance or ask for help. Because of their lower population density and isolation, um, it, it seems a little, um, uh, it doesn't seem to make sense, but we do experience something called the goldfish effect. So you might think that if you're in a community where people are very spread apart and it's maybe rural farm communities, nobody really knows what each other is doing. And it's the exact opposite. We often experience something called the goldfish effect. So if you can picture yourself sitting in a little goldfish bowl, everybody knows your business. Everybody sees what you're doing. If you try to go to the local clinic for services, they know your vehicle. They most likely know everybody who's staffed at that clinic. And chances are you will see them at the cafe or at that bar later on that day. So it's everybody is in your business, which in some cases makes it very supportive. They're very, very helpful. In other cases, it's extremely stigmatizing and there's a tremendous lack of confidentiality um, that's there. In many cases, providers who live in their communities will experience a dual relationship, meaning their children um, of the providers and the clients go to school together, they um, worship at the same church, and they, they run in the same social circles, and that can be for very awkward types of conversations. Next slide. Um, so I wanted to just kind of talk a little bit about the rural access challenge and look at that kind of through a framework of the health access framework. And so when we talk about rural challenges, really it's availability, 
the distance to get to care, transportation concerns to get there, and just the lack of services that can be offered within a rural community. And maybe those who are there not having that expertise that we've already talked about. There's a definite lack of integrated care options. Um, we've talked about the very limited pharmacies, but I'd also like you to consider that um, rural areas are often food deserts. There's a lot of food insecurity that happens in these areas. They may or may not have WIC services. And in some cases, they don't even have grocery stores. So for them to maintain healthy nutrition to help with their recovery, their, or their pregnancy, for example, they might be buying their food at a convenience store at a gas station. That's, that's the reality. Um, when we look at acceptability, self-stigma comes into play as well as perceived stigma and community stigma. Many people are embarrassed to seek services for their substance use um, treatment. Um, in some cases, they don't have access to get to that um, prenatal care. Um, and, and if they are um, drug exposed, then they're concerned about sharing that when they come to that prenatal appointment. So there can be a lot of fear that's there. There's also a lot of fear of going against the social or the cultural norms. So if you're in a community where everybody gets together and drinks on the weekend, and now you're gonna come and try to disclose that you've got an alcohol use dis um, disorder, how does that get navigated? And how do you lose the peers who have up till now have been your support system um, when you've gone there? There's stigmatized perceptions of sexuality and very much gender norms are focused on in rural um, communities. This type of cultural influence greatly um, impacts their acceptability of seeking family, play, um, family planning care and substance use care as well. Um, occasionally, we will even see a lack of trust in the healthcare providers because they don't feel that they have that confidentiality. Next slide. Approachability is something also to consider, meaning that many people in rural communities may not perceive their need for healthcare or perceive that they actually have access to services that are close enough for them to take part in. Um, we see that health knowledge is impacted here. They don't know how to access the services. They have a lower health literacy when it comes to general reproductive health knowledge and their understanding of substance use disorders and the treatment that might be an option for them. For example, if they've only heard that they may be able to use methadone to treat an opioid use disorder, they may not be familiar, familiar with a local clinic who offers buprenorphine. So instead of driving three hours to access methadone, is there an option for me to stay locally to be able to do that? Affordability is huge, especially when you look at indirect costs. So not only do they have insurance coverage or the means to cover the treatment itself, but how much is it going to cost for them to get to that treatment? How much cost is added by transportation for them to, to, to um, go out of their communities to access that care? If we're talking about a woman with a family um, and she has to add two or three hours drive onto her treatment appointment, what type of costs will be associated with childcare while she's able to do that? And then finally, the appropriateness. What is a good fit for services? Do the providers in the area have the adequate training that they need to deliver treatment for substance use disorders, for family planning, or even obstetric care? Um, we also have to look at provider bias. Um, one of the newer articles that's cited for you here had come out and was actually conducted in Appalachia. Um, and they um, interviewed a lot of clients of family planning um, clinics and providers. And many clients perceived a push for LARCs if they disclosed a substance use disorder. And they noted that they often didn't get a choice in the type of, of contraception options that they were offered or talked about. And then what does family planning even mean? Um, unfortunately, in many rural areas in North Dakota, if you say family planning, it's immediately associated with abortion services. So there's a lack of understanding about the breadth of family planning and how that works. Next slide. So one of the ways that we're trying to address this challenge in North Dakota is through a program that um, called Don't Quit the Quit. And we're a newly funded program through the Foundation for Opioid Response Efforts. We are working with this program in collaboration with North Dakota WIC and with the Hartfree Foundation, which is one of our primary um, champion facilities for um, MOUD and MAT services. Next slide. What we are trying to do is um, three aims. We're looking at access, education, and support. So we're trying to address access by growing the number of providers who will prescribe medications for opioid use disorder within an eight county region that is in the most rural area of North Dakota. We've included mentoring in this program as well as waiver stipends to help providers get going um, with their um, DEA numbers, uh, DEAX numbers. We've expanded education here to include um, substance use training for all of our WIC agencies in our region. Um, we talk a lot about basic foundational information as well as continuity of care, referral um, resources, and nutrition specific to OUD recovery. 
Um, we also look at offering free monthly webinars that are open to women who choose to participate in our program, as well as community providers, family members, and friends, so that we're not delivering education in a siloed fashion, but rather expanding that so everybody's getting common education. Mothers who choose to participate in this program are eligible for additional um, diapers um, through the program. And then we include additional cultural training with our Native American, um, about Native American birth practices. And then we are also working to increase community support in the postpartum period um, by training um, community members to become postpartum doulas so that they can help deliver that unbiased support to families impacted by substance use disorders. Next slide. This is just a little peek at what our service area looks like. So the state of North Dakota is down to your right and we are in that little box up in the center there. And here's just a, a look at where we've distributed our services so far. To date, we have had five clinic systems come on board. We've trained, um, trained 13 WIC staff members. We have so far trained four postpartum doulas, hoping to grow some more there. Um, and then we have um, really closed in that loop to say that you know, women, for example, living in the Fay County region now have five options for receiving um, care for OUD treatment. And because if you look at the little corner by where it's called Devil's Lake, this is a facility now where women can not only receive treatment for SUD, they have um, family practice providers who have now become wavered to offer those treatment services and they can still travel there for obstetric services and look at having some uh, more promising continuity of care. Um, if trying to just give you a scope, if you look at the person who might be circled in the city of Rugby, right in the center of that um, service area map, that that person still has about an hour and a half drive to get to a place of being able to deliver um, her baby. So that is a, um, a quite a, a distance for her to travel, but she can at least get her care for SUD treatment right in her community now. And it's about a 30 minute drive for the nearest family planning services. So she's still got some way to go, but we're trying to bring that in a little bit closer for her. Okay, and I, I think that'll bring me to the end if there are any questions. Uh, well, thank you, everybody. This was like, these were incredible presentations. And um, I think really illustrate the, uh, you know, like the diversity of, 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 of intersections between, you know, uh, behavioral and reproductive health, you know, uh, and, and, and beyond, you know, pregnancy um, specifically. I see that there's a question in the chat box. And I was going to ask you, we have until what time for all of this? Um, I want to make sure that the audience we have has until um, 2.30, but if panelists are available to stay later, we can keep going until people get tired. Yeah, so the way, so please, um, um, you know, like type in, type questions into the Q&A box. There's one, and I really want to, um, <laughs> you know, make this as interactive as possible and really prioritize, um, you know, the audience for asking questions. So there's one already in the Q&A box. And I'll read that, and then if, if, if there's a lull, I'll ask some other questions. So, um, and 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 feel free to any of you, you know, actually um, answer, and you can expand from this. So, like in rural communities, how have political values influenced uptake of services? Are there best practices for building trust and overcoming political resistance? So. Um, I think you could speak to that first regarding political, like, you know, communities, uh, in rural communities. <clears throat> but I think these issues also emerge, you know, perhaps in other spaces that the rest of you can uh, mention as well. Sure, I can start by just talking a little bit about North Dakota, um, definitely more of um, a Republican state. Um, it has impacted. We saw a great deal of um, controversy, especially when the Title X ruling came out and I was working in family planning at the time. Um, we actually had um, people calling to try to sabotage our services, meaning they call to, to wonder how they could ask the right questions, see if they could trap us on offering their incorrect information, coming into our clinic sites to make sure we hadn't posted things incorrectly. Um, it was huge. Um, and unfortunately, it really impacted the, the safety that men and women felt to be able to come into our facilities to, to seek that care. Um, as far as another view from the political end, our governors, um, the first lady of the state of North Dakota comes from a place of lived experience um, and substance use disorder. And she has really tried to increase awareness in our state 
So we look to her towards increase in our acceptability. So um, we have um, conferences that happen, um, reinventing recovery, North Dakota reinvents recovery um, every year. And they're drawing thousands of people who are coming be able to share their stories and talk about services and that expansion to services. So it is getting a little bit better, um, but there's still a great deal of stigma, especially surrounding women in the perinatal period. Other comments from, uh, you know, from the panelists around, you know, um, a sort of like political and other sorts of differences um, within communities and how you engage, you know, strategies for engagement. I'll address that if I may. Uh, I, what I have seen is that the best way to reach communities is to hire people who use drugs and pay them a living wage and offer them advancement in your organizations. Because uh, pe people who use drugs are often described as, uh, as manipulative, but what I see is that they are smart and they can smell a rat and they know when you don't know what you're talking about. And so if you can partner in an equitable fashion with people who use drugs currently or who have used have lived experience of substance use and pregnancy in particular in the past, then that's how you engage these communities. Um, and, and I see that a lot right here where I'm at in Arizona right now is is the folks that I work with in hospitals are like, oh well they don't, you know, they don't come for prenatal care. So what can you do? Well, what you can do is put on your boots and go out to the places where these people are. Um, go to syringe service providers, go to the free clinics and partner with these folks, hire them as your outreach coordinators and hire them as your support people and get them into your programs. And that's how you can engage communities that are uh, so-called hard to reach is by engaging those communities. So um, just a reminder to the audience to, you know, enter questions into the um, Q&A feature. So um, uh, both of you like sort of I touched on things that I think other people also touched on or something I was reflecting on through, through, the, um, um, through the presentations, which is what, you know, like um, from both a, uh, you know, individual level perspective, from a state agency perspective, from like a, you know, ask the type of, you know, sort of public health national organization perspective, there's recognition of a sort of a misalignment to some extent between what people need and what we provide. And that's both in terms of service delivery and also I think, you know, in terms of like, um, you know, the evaluation of, 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 of what it is um, that we do. And, um, and, and so I guess, so once one, you know, um, strategy for that, like um, uh, Joelle that you mentioned is, is, you know, the including people, you know, from communities, people with lived experiences and et cetera. Um, do any of you have sort of comments from you and reflections on, you know, how to better align, you know, what people um, need with, um, you know, what we provide and how we sort of evaluate and assess what we provide other, you know, beyond, in addition to that, like strategies that might have worked and et cetera. One, one thought I can offer is that, um, we, within the commu medical communities that I'm part of, we worked really, really hard to change the education to look at substance use disorders as a chronic disease. If we talk about, especially rural folks in North Dakota, they're more comfortable talking about diabetes and heart disease and maybe changing their cholesterol a little bit than they are about substance use disorders. So trying to change that dialogue to look at it from a chronic disease standpoint where they need treatment for that. We've also really done a lot of work on our language and trying to change that first person language and talk about reoccurrence of use and not um, uh, re relapsing, for example, or using a medication to treat an opioid use disorder as, as far instead of using one drug instead of another drug. Um, so looking at the language and the education, um, I think is helpful, but it takes time and it takes patience to do that. Yeah, and those are really good points about about language. And, and and my perspective is is that as you know that we we should lead, you know, with the language, and 
And um, and this is also a space sometimes where things can be seen as quote unquote political, right? Um, and 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 it, and it can even be very, I think, frustrating uh, in that the language changes, right? You know that. Um, and we see this in diagnostic criteria. It used to be called, you know, drug abuse or dependence, and now it's substance use disorder, and 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 that's actually just a feature of one of language and how we have to, you know, which is always changing, but is also I think has to be, you know, deliberately adapted to what also changes, which is like stigma and discrimination kind of catch up to the language. Um, I there's there's a any other sort of thoughts or comments? And, and if not, um, there's a, another a question sort of in the, in, in the um, Q&A, which relates to um, sort of the, 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 uh, um, illness and, and co-occurrence and et cetera. Um, and, um, you know, since um, uh, substance use disorder often has comorbidity with mental health, is there a framework um, for education at middle and high schools? So, um, in, in, you know, and I think there's, um, uh, there's a lot of different ways. So, so really, um, uh, shifting gears, actually, I think the proper lens is thinking about like prevention, you know, when we talk in both primary prevention, which means, you know, preventing an illness before it develops, as well as secondary prevention, which is intervening very early in the course um, to minimize, you know, the, um, uh, the, the, the negative sequelae. Um, and I think, you know, education can be part of that and certainly targeting things at um, school age children um, it is oftentimes understood, you know, under um, uh, prevention. So um, anyone want to um, talk about that or respond to that? I can jump in <laughs> and just Great. again, it's just one example, but um, our school district in um, the city where I reside really um, made an effort to start talking about things like ESPERT. Um, so screening, brief um, intervention, referral to treatment, but really we've been encouraging them to look at it from that peer perspective. So while they say, how can I, you know, I don't wanna take one child aside. I don't wanna just talk about this, but looking at group education to highlight what what moderation is, what does it mean to be risk showing, demonstrating risky behavior? Um, if, is this going on at home and the child is, is trying to talk about it with their school caseworker so that they understand? So um, I think taking it to an appropriate peer level um, and start talking about how you can almost go through a complete screening assessment in the form of a conversation or a group um, uh, a symposium, if you you know would, getting everybody together, it's never too early to start talking about it. So understanding, even having kids know what the risks are, what is the peer pressure doing, what how do I have a conversation if I don't want to to use a substance at this point. So um, within school districts, I think there is a great place to start with that prevention work. Um, they're seeing it at home. They may be taking part of it really early themselves. They see their peers engaged to it. They're getting into vehicles um, with people who are misusing substances. It's never too early to start the conversation. Yeah, and, and, and I'll add to that. I think that, um, I think many of you have sort of mentioned this as well, that, you know, education that is, you know, appropriate, you know, for somebody's age, but also that is like, you know, um, factually based and not fear-based. And probably, you know, one of my favorite parts of the um, National, NIDA, the National Institute of Drug Abuse website are the materials that are designed for, um, you know, mostly for adolescents and how they, you know, sort of frame conversations, frame, you know, what happens in the brain and, you know, and, and, and they're in, and, and I actually use those um, in, you know, in, 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 in discussing, you know, in framing, you know, one, you know, the perspective, the, you know, the, the disease kind of model of addiction. Um, one theme that's emerged um, has been touched on, it really relates to inequities and um, both, you know, the rural inequities so geographic as well as like racial inequities um, um, at this intersection of, you know, substance use and pregnancy. And I really, I, and I guess I, any, I would like anyone to talk, but in particular, you know, like state, you know, Ohio State Child Welfare, as well as like, you know, the health department perspective. To you know, um, to comment on um, you know, how, you know what 
um, to comment on this. And so a couple of, you know, as we know, you know, there are, um, we've known for decades, you know, just like how um, opioid prescribing uh, for chronic pain, like we prescribed more to white people than to non-white people. So that same sort of the racism that underlies that it exists within the addiction treatment system as well. So we, um, you know, methadone is somewhat, I don't know, preferentially is not the right word, but you know, non-white people are more likely to get methadone when they get a medication and they're actually more, they're less, they're, they get a slightly lower dose than white people do within methadone system. That same pattern may or may not exist in buprenorphine. To my knowledge, it has not, you know, really um, um, been looked like and clearly under medicating somebody for a chronic condition has consequences in terms of, you know, return to use, um, overdose risk, overdose death risk, and et cetera. And that might partially explain, you know, s s some of these data. <clears throat> there are also gender, you know, um, inequities within this, and that might explain, you know, both in terms of over prescribing of opioids, you know, um, by gender, you know, comparing women to men, but also sort of like a lack of awareness or, 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 or um, expectation perhaps that, you know, um, you know, people who are women, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, are people who use drugs and, and hence, you know, like a sort of a less likely to be screened within general healthcare settings, less likely to receive naloxone at the time of an overdose, you know, and, and, and et cetera. So what, you know, from both a sort of, uh, from an equity lens of overcoming, um, uh, what, you know, what, what are, you know, um, as well as an evaluation piece. So my question for the state people is like, how are you looking at this? How are you counting this stuff? And then for, for everyone, like, you know, um, how, do we, how do we address, um, you know, these inequities in, in, in society and in this, this particular um, domain? going to unmute myself again. Um, working at the state level and at child welfare level, um, I think when, when I've been developing these trainings and working with the different agencies involved um, in presenting these trainings, the biggest population that I saw was missing was actually talking directly to these, these mothers that are in in MAT therapy. So one of the things I started doing after about a year in, when I was um, going out and training with the child welfare agencies and the hospitals and the treatment facilities um, kind of all together, I'm like, we're missing the most important population here, which is talking directly with these moms. Um, so I have um, over the last year tried to get into the hospitals that have MAT programs in them, as well as some of the um, single sourced uh, treatment centers in Ohio and talk directly to those mothers and went in there and let them know, you know, I've worked with child welfare. I know the fears that are involved with um, disclosing any information in regards to substance use and, and how that can impact you um, as a mom and having child welfare come in and potentially um, take custody of your baby. But answering those questions and explaining that actually now you need to share that information um, so that the hospitals can share with child welfare when that referral is made that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're actively involved. Um, in your therapy and um, have a plan afterwards to, to continue that therapy. Um, most of the people that, are, that, that I have talked to have been very um, appreciative of me coming in and talking directly with them and answering honestly what will happen once you go into a hospital. Um, and your, your baby's gonna be showing signs of withdrawal and you're involved in the MAT therapy. Um, CARE is, wasn't put into place to punish these, these parents, but, but more so because we've been missing opportunities to, to work with these families and to link them with appropriate services. Also, um, the idea was to um, 
Governor DeWine here in Ohio has really put a lot of effort into to working in child welfare, but to put the money into child welfare and the education um, in, into our systems. But we have, you know, child review fatality boards, and a lot of those cases are linked to um, mothers going home and falling asleep or rollover deaths um, in, involved in these cases. But those are the cases sometimes that we don't get the referrals on either. So when we were reviewing those cases at the child welfare level, hospitals didn't necessarily call it in because it appeared that mom was, was doing great and was bonding with her baby and told them that they had all their services in place. So this plan of safe care is gonna hopefully um, be adding to um, the safe or minimizing the safety and risk of those infants that are gonna be returning home with mom. Um, there is a lot of biased referrals that come in. Um, we are having some um, initiatives being put into place here in Ohio on universal screening and what that's gonna look like. Um, we have pilot counties right now working on that starting actually January 4th um, here in Franklin County with four of the major metro um, hospitals here and what universal screening will look like, what those numbers will look like after this is put in place versus before. Um, so some of those evaluations are going to be done. Um, as I'm rambling, but I, I think the biggest piece we've missed in the past is working directly like jo Joelle, is that how you pronounce your name, um, stated is working directly with those mothers, um, getting some mentors in place that have gone through the experiences um, so that they can work directly with the families. We do have a mentoring program um, that Governor DeWine is uh, behind, it's the, the STAR program, um, and that is basically having a family peer mentor work with these families um, that have open cases in the past and successfully um, transitioned out of that. So that's actually one of the more, more successful um, initiatives that we have in here, here in Ohio. So I'll stop rambling. Hopefully I answered that question somehow. <laughs> Other comments from the panelists? So I want to acknowledge the time. I'm able to stick around for like another 20 minutes if other people are. It looks like there's a bunch of participants still here. Um, let me know or chat, if, you know, like if, if you can't, totally understandable. Um, one, you know, speaking of sort of plans of safe care, um, uh, the, you know, so, so I'll, I'll explain like where I, where I see them as being kind of um, uh, potentially transformational, and, and you know, and that might be setting it up a little bit too high, but because it, it really, you know, so CAPTA is an old piece of federal legislation that gets reauthorized periodically, dates back to the Nixon era, and um, and it wasn't, I think, until 2010 or so that it was acknowledged in the federal statute that babies, you know, come from pregnant people. And, um, and that, you know, up until then, the needs of mother and parents was actually not part of it. And, and the plans of safe care really, so hence, you know, sort of emerges from this recent period of time, which has, you know, I think you could say positives and negatives, but in the positives is really like sort of, um, you know, introduced, <laughs> you know, this um, a language of, 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 of dyad you know, to, um, you know, to, to, to child welfare and the focus on the plan of safe care being not, you know, strictly, you know, attention to what the urine drug test, you know, which, um, which we know is not, you know, is not the proper way to assess like a chronic condition, as well as to assess who needs what, you know, uh, for, for safe parenting and et cetera, and is subject to like, you know, it's, it's a place of, 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 of the practice of um, like racial and other forms of discrimination um, because it, you know, it's about like, you know, what does this family need at this point in time? So this sort of dyadic model, I think is, you know, is, is that's what kind of, I mean, that shouldn't have to be transformative, but it actually sort of does feel like it. Um, you know, so yet, um, the recent, and this has been known, I, I felt this anecdotally, but recently, like we have some data to actually support it, that, um, you know, people who have a child removed have, you know, higher odds of, of, of having an overdose. 
And, um, <clears throat> and you know, and, and this is an, in, in the period, the postpartum period, which is a period in general of increased vulnerabilities to, to, to overdose, in part driven by, you know, insurance churn, lack of coverage, withdrawal of the medical system from care, you know, um, and et cetera. So I guess, you know, if you, um, to think about like how, you know, both from a service delivery and evaluative perspective, like, you know, how to keep the dyad centered, sort of, um, you know, you know, is it the data piece, and I struggle with this all the time with like population health data that, you know, uh, mom and baby are uncoupled, you know, at the time of delivery, and it's it's some it's it sometimes can be impossible to get like a merged data set. Um, <clears throat> uh, so just and and you so, so just thoughts and reflections on you know um, on 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 centering on the dyad. You know, one thought I have that um, it's certainly not going to do the work of policy change, but a, a couple of things, looking at that decriminalization and taking away the punitive um, consequences that are there, but really looking at the social media um, and the framing that happens through media um, and how they continue to perpetuate that this isn't a dyad, that this is a, a, a concern only for the, the infant. And one example I often use with students is to really think back over time at the um, campaigns, the public service announcements that you've seen regarding FAS, for example. Can you think of one where they talked about a treatment option for mom or services for mom to help with mom? It's all focused on what did she do to this baby and this is the consequence and the result of what's there. So just knowing the social media world that we live in now, um, it is one piece that I think we can't ignore, that we have to change that campaign. We have to change what we're putting into that social media and that framing that the media has the power to control. Um, and I just can't help but wonder if it would have a little bit of an impact to start changing how we think about things. We actually developed um, a form letter that we send to journalists. <laughs> we recently read your paper blah, or your article, blah, blah, blah. And then we have a paragraph for each of the, because let's be real, there's like six or seven things that they all do repeatedly. Um, and that, that helped respond to that really well. And it also helped us develop some relationships with journalists, which is really, really useful as a boring academic who has trouble translating facts into stuff that people actually want to hear. Um, so uh, yeah, I haven't actually used that in, in a couple years probably, but if anybody's interested, just uh, shoot me an email and I can send you our form letter that we developed for just this purpose. Because we found ourselves um, being distracted from like our real work with responding just with outrage to all of these terrible uh, media articles. That we found that helpful. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think that reflects something else that, you know, um, that I, I feel like emerges uh, in any kind of work, but also sort of in, in these spaces, which is, you know, like that um, the rush to judgment that I have sometimes about the motivations of other people in their, um, let's say in their, in their, for example, in their journalistic um, presentation. Um, and, and I found like, you know, like the, the, the you know, like, um, you know, to check my bias, um, <laughs> you know, in, in, in that response, because generally speaking, people don't want to be, to offend others, you know, <laughs> um, there can be intentionality to um, um, discrimination and punishment and stuff, but, that, and that's, that, that, you know, we, that happens, but um, I think most of the time when these sorts of things happen, it's it's a reflection of of of, of ignorance um, and, and not knowing. You know, sometimes it's just language based. Sometimes it's you know just how we, you know, sort of talked about things, <clears throat> and it's not categorically or inherently, you know, political or punitive or or purposely punitive. Um, and um, so, so kind of like, you know, just like how we, um, yeah, yeah, meeting journalists where they're at, it's, it's just exactly, um, and expecting the best, you know, <clears throat> you know, from people, just like how we, how we, how we sit with people. Um, other sorts of um, thoughts, comments from, 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 um, on this, from, from the, from the panel.
So I, you know, I, I feel like um, um, uh, you, uh, this was sort of um, um, touched on, um, but, but I'm gonna make, uh, in, in, in the theme of stuff that um, assumptions that we make in this space. Um, here's another assumption that I sometimes make in this space. And I, and, 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 I, and I think it comes from a good place, but I make the assumption that somebody who is pregnant and let's say, at, and delivering wants to be that child's parent, you know? And um, so, uh, and, 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 you know, and, and I marshal all of my, you know, clinical and other resources to support, you know, her autonomy and parenting, but I rarely ever, you know, um, and, and usually I'm right, <laughs> but I'm not always, I'm not always right. So, um, uh, you know, one thing that, you know, has been touched on just a little bit is really like how conversations around, you know, what we call like sort of options counseling. So both like abortion and like adoption, how those like how to handle those, you know, like um, in this space in ways that, you know, don't make that assumption that 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 um, that, that I um, uh, admitted to making. That's a tough conversation. Um, and, and honestly, one of the first places that I start is I, I simply ask, how are you feeling about the pregnancy? And try to start the conversation from their point of view, see if I can figure out a little bit of where they're coming to, um, take some information in about the environment. Did she have somebody come into the, the office setting with her? Is there somebody waiting out there? Does she have express fear? But starting the conversation from that. And then I often just say, anytime that I work with somebody who comes into this office pregnant, I ask, how are you feeling about the pregnancy? Are you planning on parenting at this time? Would you like to talk about options for the pregnancy? Now, certainly I can do that in a primary care setting. Working within Title 10, that conversation looks very differently and it becomes a different kind of strategy. So I also think we have to think about where we're working. And then if somebody is expressing their desire to want to continue the pregnancy and to parent this pregnancy, what resources do you need? How do we engage you into services to make this a successful pregnancy? But let them also know that anything they talk about is it's a safe place for them to talk about. We often talk about the ambivalent, um, um, ambivalent feelings that come along with any pregnancy. So in the most desired circumstances of somebody coming into a pregnancy and wanting this so bad, there's still ambivalence and there's still fear and there's still concern. And that that happens in every single pregnancy that comes forward. There's joy and there's fear and there's, um, there's some not so happy thoughts <laughs> in every single pregnancy. So I think giving them a safe place to talk about that is a good starting point and making that almost in itself a universal approach. And, and I think when, when working with women um, who are using or misusing substances during their pregnancy, you know, when they're coming into the hospital, there's that fear that child welfare, once again, is going to come out there and do an interview and potentially re remove another child from them. Um, we see, you know, mothers come in repeatedly giving, gi giving birth um, and multiple times we remove, have had to remove that, that infant from them. I think it's more than necessary to have a conversation with that mom prior to delivery saying, what can we do to help you? How can we help get some, some services linked up now so that when you do deliver, we can share the progress that you've been making during your pregnancy. You know, when I worked at child welfare at the intake um, level, the referrals that come in from hospitals were typically um, mom gave birth today at 3.30 p.m. Um, infant's been withdrawing. Um, mom's going to be discharged tomorrow. What do you want us to do? That's not a lot of information that, that we get. So with CARA and the plans to save care, the responsibilities now are increased on the people making those referrals so that they need to gather the information prior to making a referral so we can make more informed decisions. So we can say, you know, this is a case where mom's already been linked with services. She's not going to need child welfare because all we're going to do is link 
her with the services that she already has in place. Um, if we need to go out and uh, make an assessment because mom's only been in treatment for two months and um, certainly we can come out and share what we will be doing, but that fear of going in the hospital delivering and that baby not going home with that mom, that is a big issue. Um, and the missing link, I think, to a lot of our education of um, what we're doing out in the communities. Um, moms are fearful, families are fearful. Who wouldn't be um, in, their, in their situation? I think we need to, to be understanding of where they're coming from. And some of these moms that more than want to, to parent their children um, and be given that opportunity. Um, I think sometimes the, the bias is that once one child's removed, every other child that they have need to be removed. And that's not necessarily the case. Um, so we, the education piece among uh, both the, the caregivers um, to these moms in the hospitals and, and themselves are um, imperative moving forward. You know, I'd like to tack on to that too, that I really think we don't fully appreciate the power of a preconception visit and an interconception visit as well. And I know that that might not be ideal that many women are and families aren't engaging in a preconception visit. However, if we're listening to even what you said, Joelle, and we're talking about meeting them where they are, if they're seeking substance use treatment, that's an ideal time to have a preconception conversation. Um, and maybe that'll look very different than moving forward if you conceive during the course of your treatment. If they have just delivered and they're engaged in postpartum care, we need to talk interconception and what are you planning more? Would you like to look ahead? What would you like to do something different? Can we put treatment into place now? So there is power in preconception and interconception, and it is completely ignored um, in the care that we're providing right now. And sometimes it's because they're not seeking that type of a visit. Sometimes it's because as providers, we're not taking the opportunity to put that into the visit that they are attending. That was a really positive note that I think we can um, leave on. And again, I'm so sorry for the technical difficulties. My screen is still frozen, but I can see everyone. <laughs> um, so I would just like to reiterate my appreciation and respect for all of our panelists, and especially Dr. Turplin, who's been with us from the beginning and really helped guide this conversation. I've learned so much about my own prejudices and assumptions, and I'm really looking forward to continuing this dialogue, not only within Ohio, but um, everywhere with our reproductive health and substance use service providers and researchers. Um, so I'd just like to say thank you again for joining us. And this session will be emailed out to all our participants. And I hope that we can remain professional contacts for a long time. And I hope everyone has a happy and healthy holiday season. Thank you very much, and thank you, panel. That was awesome. Those were yes. great talks. I really learned a lot. Thank you. Yeah, we really could keep going forever. <laughs> okay, Gabby, can you close the meeting for me? <laughs> thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. Bye.